Welcome, everybody. Uh, what a privilege to get back on online net with Lent program and welcome to Awareness Live uh, Lent program 2022. Um, welcome to those who are joining on Zoom and welcome to uh, our friends and around the world uh, on Facebook. And uh, let me just give you an idea how, how everything is going to work. Huda is going to admit everybody or anybody comes to Zoom and as we uh, continue the program. So the program is uh, an hour and the speaker will speak for 20 minutes, then he will suffer my engagement <laughs> with oh. questions and discussion, whoever the, uh, the speaker is, for 20 minutes. And then uh, the floor is yours to pose any questions from uh, our friends on Facebook or our friends on Zoom. So, and it's an enormous pleasure for to launch this program uh, to, to have our first guest, the Reverend Dr. Tim McCubbin. Uh, Tim and I, the, the connection goes back to um, 2004, I, I believe. Uh, and after just less than a year of the establishment of the Awareness Foundation. And um, uh, Tim was the, the head of Sarum College, which is a, a theological college in Salisbury, England. And he was the, uh, the head there. And we had our first ever Awareness Foundation conference for the awareness course at Sarum College with the uh, generous host of uh, Tim and, and Sarum College. And through Tim, of course, I met uh, Steve Tabor. Welcome, Steve, from uh, the end of the world, uh, California, or the beginning of the world. <laughs> we are delighted. And also Danny, my goodness, Danny, um, long time. You remember when we, we were, Danny was on the board of the foundation representing Sarum College on the board in America, our American friends board. So, uh, Danny, what a wonderful thing to see you But after so many years. And um, welcome to all our friends. Uh, 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 Tim McQuibbon was also the Methodist liaison and, and the ecumenical uh, liaison in the Vatican in Rome um, for, for many years. And um, uh, we are delighted, Tim, that you are with us. He is now uh, in his... Um, uh, retirement exile in the north of England <laughs> and he will tell us a little bit about himself before he starts. Uh, Tim, the floor is yours. The series is the statements uh, of the I am's of Jesus in the gospel according to John. Tim, I will shut up and you will have the floor for 20 minutes, please. Thank you. So not too many introductions, and if my time is limited. Uh, Nadim, it's a delight and pleasure to head off your series tonight uh, and, and to do it in this way. I don't think I need to add more. Uh, um, my my me Methodist ministerial career was mostly in theological education. I have to say, by way of uh, an, uh, uh, an apologia pro vita mea, uh, that I am not a biblical uh, scholar. Uh, I am a preacher, uh, and I am a church historian, uh, and those uh, two uh, in international Methodism to the World Methodist Council, whom I represent for glorious years. Uh, we're, this time next week, we're, we'll be preparing to go back for the first time for two years, uh, hopefully, uh, if, if the, uh, the, the bureaucracy allows us and all the, the, uh, the protocols that we have to go through. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I, I will proceed. The, the passage that I uh, want to focus on is, of course, John 6, 25 to 35, which I will read. 
When they found Jesus on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God that is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. If you've been to France for a holiday, it's difficult there to imagine a petit déjeuner, a breakfast without the crusty bread to go with the first coffee of the day. And the workers going home at lunchtime on the streets of Paris and countless towns and villages are mostly to be seen with a baguette under their arms, fresh from the bakery. It's perhaps difficult for us sometimes in our comfortable affluent society to understand the importance of bread, unless we turn on our television and watch what is going on in so many different parts of the world today, when there are no basic foodstuffs, whether a bread or maize or rice, then there is suffering and famine. A simple loaf of bread in certain parts of the world means life itself. It is only as we comprehend that situation that we really begin to understand the importance of bread, not only for now, but also in the time of Jesus. Significant theological events in the Bible revolve around the subject of bread. Just think for one moment of all those occasions in the Hebrew scriptures when the provision of food was the occasion for, of giving thanks to the God who cares for his people. Perhaps, of course, the most important event in the history of the Jews was the Exodus event, the journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. What caused the Hebrews to be in Egypt in the first place? It was for want of bread. The wheat crop had failed due to drought, and the Hebrews had migrated to Egypt because there was a surplus in storage there. It was bread, or the lack of it, that initiated this whole change of, uh, chain of events, which meant they had to endure captivity and oppression at the hands of the Egyptians. And all was because they needed bread. When God led them across the Red Sea to achieve their liberation with the promise of a, a new land full of milk and honey, they first of all had to face starvation in the bleak wilderness to which they had to pass. God heard their cries of despair and rained down bread from heaven in the form of manna. He was a faithful God who would not let them perish. So many examples I could share with you. My favorite example, of course, is Elijah in the desert, uh, chosen by God to speak to the king and the people and bring them back to God. Uh, things seemed to be going horribly wrong out in the desert, but he was fed by ravens, bread God provided for his faithful servants. Fast forward then to the time of Jesus. When Jesus began his ministry, as we'll be remembering this Sunday, he went into the desert where he was tempted. As the hot sun bore down upon him, he looked out with sweaty eyes at the round white rocks, and we are told that they took on the appearance of loaves of bread. Satan was tempting Jesus to give bread to the people and end the suffering of the world hunger. 
And yet Jesus spurns that temptation because, as he said, humanity cannot live by bread alone. And as Jesus' disciples implored him to teach them how to pray, it was in the midst of that prayer, the Lord's Prayer as we know it, that he reminds them and us of the importance of the bread of life. He prayed, give us this day our daily bread. He prays to the Father who is the source of all life. But perhaps supremely we remember bread because at the Last Supper, Jesus took a loaf of bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is given, broken for you. And then after his resurrection, when he met some of his disciples on the road to Emmaus, it was in the breaking of the bread that his true identity was discovered. So we've heard, just heard from the passage from John's Gospel, which, of course, if you remember the context, immediately follows the story of how Jesus fed a vast crowd, 5,000 or so, with a small amount of bread. His miracle there on the lakeside generated controversy. A group of scribes approach Jesus and say, in effect, if you're the Messiah, then prove it. There had been a strong rabbinic belief that when the Messiah came, he too would bring manna from heaven. This had been the superman act of Moses, and surely they reasoned the Messiah could surpass that. The Messiah, it was thought, would outperform the signs of Moses. He who was to come would do something far better. Jesus then turns the tables. He tells them that they'd misinterpreted the Moses event. First of all, he reminds them that the bread had not come from Moses, but from God. They were putting the emphasis in the wrong place, on the person, on the miracle worker, rather than God. Secondly, they failed to see that the real bread from heaven was not manna at all. That was only meant to be a symbol of the true bread and sustenance. The real bread from heaven comes down and feeds not only the physical needs of humanity, but also our spiritual hunger as well. God's provision for God's people. And it was at this point that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. To satisfy our hunger for meaning in life, we cannot only eat the bread of earth. To fill our supermarket trolleys with vast arrays of food coming from every part of the globe which we enjoy, and most of which do us good, though they use up far too many air miles. Supplying physical needs is of course important, but there is a deeper aspect to this whole issue. If Jesus wasn't careful, this whole thing of giving bread could quickly degenerate into a tool to win friends and influence people. He would become just another demagogue, just another politician or ruler, giving things to the people to buy popularity and support. You see, bread can be used as a weapon. The Roman emperors were famous for their provision of bread and circuses, to keep their peoples in the empire under control. On the surface, feeding the world's hungry sounds like such an ideal thing, but when the whole issue is examined, it becomes much more complex. In the novel, The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky, a scene that takes place between an old church cardinal who is engaged in the Spanish Inquisition it sounds a bit Monty Pythonish here, and Jesus, who supposedly now has come back to earth. The crooked old cardinal chastises Jesus for missing a golden opportunity in the desert when he did not give bread to the people. Quote, mankind, seek, would have run after you, grateful and obedient, though forever trembling with fear that you might withdraw your hand and they would no longer have loaves. 
you did not want to make men slaves, but here too your judgment was too high for all men are slaves. End of quote. But of course, people soon bite the hand that feeds them. The temptation to give bread to the world may have been the greatest that Jesus ever experienced because of his obvious compassion for those who are hungry, so many of whom were children. He had to do by refusing to fall into that tempting trap. Bread plays a significant role in every country and in every person's life. It comes in, of course, all shapes and sizes, flavors and variations with additions. Our commercial world has made it a marketable commodity, which detracts from the basic necessity at its heart. It is a basic human condition that we ought to try to meet for everyone on this planet, on God, in God's world. There is food enough for all, but surely we must understand that what we have to offer is more, far more. It is the word of God incarnate in Jesus, who is the bread of life. We must recognize that to satisfy our, our hunger heaven eternal life and to do that we must eat the bread in its most elementary form dead bread only sustains life we are therefore it does not make life what god intended to be, it to be without the spiritual dimension to life we are merely animals to satisfy our hunger for spiritual sustenance we cannot only eat the bread of the earth, we must also eat the bread of life given by God. That bread is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It's to be found in the words of scripture. It's to be found in the lives of those filled with the spirit of the risen Christ. And it is to be found supremely in our sacramental meal, whatever we call it, which we eat in thankfulness that he who sustains us will be the spiritual food for all of our journeys. It's like coming to recharge our batteries, which have run flat in the last week from our car or because we've left the car lights on or because, because we've given out in compassion and care to others all that we've got, got and we've exhausted ourselves by being distracted by the cares of the world. The crowd said to Jesus, they demanded it, give us the bread from heaven. Do what Moses did and we will be satisfied. We will be convinced. Jesus, however, is never that is what Jesus Christ ultimately provided for us, a quality of life beyond mere existence and survival, a way to get ourselves beyond and experience life and an intensity of life that comes from being sustained by the bread of heaven. There's a book by Professor Ursula King, formerly of the University of Bristol, on the search for spirituality which describes all the different forms of spirituality in the different religious faiths in the world, as well as in social institutions of government, the arts and sciences, and with many with a common feature, such as prayer, healing, shared meals, to meet the needs of a world torn apart by suffering and violence. She concludes, quote, Spirituality is not a permanent retreat from the world into the monastery or desert or cave, not even into the silence of one's own heat or the depth of one's own mind. Rather, arising out of the midst of lived experience, spirituality implies the very point of entry into the fullness of life by giving meaning value and direction 
to all that humans do and are. So let us make that part of our regular spiritual discipline, especially in this Lent, which we've now begun, to eat of that food which does not perish. Let's take of the bread that is here today and forever. And we meet sacrament meals and we encounter in our reading of the Bible, the word which connects with everyday lives and sustains us. So let us share in the bread of life, which nourishes us for now and for all eternity. To satisfy our hunger for heaven, we must eat the bread of heaven. And that sustains us for our journey, which we share with others who are part of our spiritual pilgrimage. That final communion sacrament meal is food for the journey from the here to the eternal. What is this bread? It is Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the bread of life now and forevermore. So let us, whenever we do, eat and be thankful and restored to do his work in the world, particularly serving the needs of those who are hungry physically and spiritually and do not know the life-saving nature of this bread for the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you very much for your uh, wisdom. And, um, and for this extensive multi-dimensional <laughs> uh, talk about, about bread. Uh, let me first uh, launch this uh, engagement by saying, as you all know, uh, in, in the Middle East, and also it was in the West before, but in the Middle East even today, uh, bread is, is the basic block of nourishment and life. And, uh, and bread is very, very important for, for the Middle East. Uh, I remember growing up, if, uh, if a piece of bread falls on the ground, we rush and take it out, pick it up, uh, kiss it, put it on our forehead, and uh, preserve it. So, um, and also when we break the pita bread around the dinner, uh, we take, we eat, we do not throw the fragments. We gather the fragments for the, the following meal. So in the Middle East, the, the tradition of bread is, is enormous. Um, my question to you, uh, uh, Tim, is today, what replaced bread in the West? What is, what, what, how do you see the, the basic sustenance for us that we treat like bread today after 2,000 years of, of Jesus saying that. I think because of the diversification of society, uh, bread is no longer the central staple uh, diet uh, in, in the certainly British people. Uh, I can't speak for, for the Americans, but uh, they, you, you can chip in here or, or later. Um, so I think our, the, the commodification of, of food uh, uh, and packaging of it in, in ways which have become added on to the price and the profitability and the profits uh, do not fall back to the people often. Um, this has meant that the simple basic necessity of bread has been, I think, nullified within our society. Though having said that, I think bread is a vital a component of the diet of the poor still uh, and, and and it is is, is so it, it is for the rich to have our pasta and our, our basmati rice or whatever which can be imported from elsewhere uh, but that basic uh, su uh, substance is, is a vital necessity for the poor 
uh, which is why governments try to keep down the price of corn uh, to make bread, uh, to allow it to be accessible. Uh, if, if the public policies allow that. So I think there is a, a sense in which bread has become less central to the diet of certainly uh, British and European people. So what, what took uh, the place of bread? Uh, um, allegorically speaking, I mean, symbolically speaking, what, what occupied this vacuum when we took bread as the necessity of life? What is as bread for us today? Our mobile phone, our internet, <laughs> our screens? Yeah, well, yes, we are so dependent upon it. Um, it, it especially in the pandemic time, uh, that sense of shared meals has, has been virtually impossible. Uh, the, hence the, the, the difficulties for our churches uh, in, in sharing communion at a time of social distancing. Um, so that, that sense in which the technology allows us to, uh, to, to share those things which we get from the concept of bread um, in, in the spoken word, in the visual word, uh, in, in the different ways we receive the essential truths uh, of what we want to share, of what it means to be human, uh, as well as what it means to be children of God. Uh, that is less focused, I think, probably on, on food uh, and more focused on material things that are uh, vital, we would say, but are they vital for our well-being? Uh, if we, rem we all remember the, 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 the event of Jesus feeding the 5,000, he was teaching them, and then time came for, of course, to provide some food, and, and the disciples came and said, we we need to feed those people. And, and Jesus very casually said, okay, give them. So, but, but then uh, um, uh, the disciples said, well, uh, I don't know how many denarii, 200 denarii wouldn't be enough for, for those people to eat bread. So uh, this, this event in the Middle East, um, um, it, it symbolizes hospitality, uh, Tim. Yeah, I'm sharing. It's yeah, sharing. hospitality is very important uh, in, in the Middle East. And bread is, was, and is still in the Middle East a symbol of hospitality. Uh, what happened to, to the hospitality in our world today? Well, it's been made more difficult recently because of COVID, but I suspect that our houses were not open unless we wanted to uh, receive um, particular people for particular times. Uh, there wasn't that shared hospitality that we had here uh, in 100 years, 200 years ago, of people going into each other's homes, uh, of sharing what little they had uh, with each other. Uh, that has become far more difficult uh, as uh, uh, property has become privatized uh, and that communal feeling of living together in community has been eroded uh, by that uh, materialism uh, and focus upon uh, other things than the basic necessities. Um, that's true and especially it, we saw that in, uh, in the pandemic hospitality became very difficult and uh, people tried to to help each other in a more creative way than meeting face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. Um, you, you mentioned a, a point in, in your uh, presentation, on your talk, which really uh, uh, struck a chord for me, which is the people, <clears throat> according to John, emphasize the wrong, um, the wrong point which is Moses. They thought Moses gave them the bread. And Jesus, uh, as Jesus did all the time, he corrected yeah. the, the, uh, their, their emphasis and, and, and lifted up their heads <clears throat> and, and helped them to see the true giver. So what have we missed in our, in today? What, what are we misfocusing? 
Are we misfocusing about something? I think we miss the point that uh, uh, God is the source of all being and all life um, because we have thought that we, we humans have become so clever, sophisticated, using all the tools of science uh, to, to, to correct things in the world which need correcting. Uh, we've forgotten that connection uh, between humanity and God. Uh, God has, has dropped out of the equation for most people. You said, um, well, for, for normal people, it's easy to say, well, God is the, 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 the true uh, bread of heaven and, and the spiritual food is important. But we have millions of people who, who lack even the, 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 the basic sustenance today. So um, before we preach, preach them to, to, to pray, are we able, or it seems we fail, and we are failing every day to even lift um, um, the, the poverty to the extent that we feed them only bread. Yes, I, it, it, this sense of, of what we have, we hold in common, uh, has gone. Um, we all have our bank accounts, which are ours. Um, how we dispose of our income, uh, is eat up to each individual in terms of uh, her or his own conscience. Uh, and one hopes that we live in a way which follows the lifestyle of Jesus, uh, which is uh, about radical hospitality and, and radical sharing. Uh, but so many instances, we fall short of that uh, in the way we buy for things for ourselves and, and, and sometimes uh, uh, deny others uh, I, I have to, if you don't mind, Nadine, mention John Wesley at least once. In the, in the, <laughs> Go ahead, you are forgiven. Will you forgive me and then <laughs> let me do so? But, I mean, John Wesley and his early Methodist community uh, uh, were radical, uh, was a radical community of sharing in the Acts uh, a 2 model. Uh, they held all things in common. Uh, and they shared amongst the the, uh, the, the uh, brothers and sisters what they had, and they gave of their disposable wealth to others. Um, John Wesley only lived on £28 a year. The rest he gave to the poor, set up hospitals and dispensaries and all the rest. Um, so there was this radical sharing implicit in the movement. But even Wesley himself, at the end of his life, uh, having um, told the early Methodists to do that, had to then preach a sermon on the... The, uh, the danger of increasing riches. Uh, as, as the people got wealthier, um, they gave less away. Mm. So there is, a, there is a lesson there for us in today's world uh, that, yes, you're quite right, uh, whether we support uh, Christian Aid or CAFOD or Oxfam or whatever, Save the Children. There are so many agencies that we can support, uh, but are they sufficient to tackle some of the systemic problems which create uh, these uh, vast uh, differences between uh, wealthy nations and poor nations. And um, are, we, are we challenging enough our politicians? Because I don't think the, the, uh, the answer is um, necessarily charities uh, no, and, no. and forget about the role of governments to, yeah. to look at, at, at the bigger picture. Yeah, I mean, what later Methodists did do was to become social reformers in terms of uh, informing public policy in a way which Wesley didn't. Uh, he, he did it on a micro level rather than a macro level. Later Methodists tried to involve uh, themselves in politics, the so-called in England, uh, Britain, the non-conformist conscience, which tried to bring uh, a Christian agenda into politics. Uh, that didn't succeed for what reasons I can't go into. We have only 20 minutes. Uh, um, and and I, I, today, politicians, do they listen? I don't know. We try. Um, there have been at least three petitions gone today to number 10 Downing Street to our British government on a variety of issues, particularly in terms of Ukraine and offering radical hospitality in a way which uh, upsets our conservative politicians who are traditionally um, uh, mm -hmm. anti-immigration, um, uh, we have to challenge them where, where there are injustices in our world, whether it's in issues of 
wealth and poverty or in issues of human dignity and the freedom to, to, uh, uh, to, to move. I would like to, to, to read what Richard said uh, here. He said, um, is it not marvelous the way Jesus used every day analogies such as bread, sheep, which we can even now understand without great intellectual demand? I Indeed, think I, it has, I mean, he has a point. He does have a point, and as, as Nadim knows, for reasons we won't go into, I could have talked and waxed eloquent uh, on the subject of, of sheep and shepherds, uh, and it's very much implicit in, in the theology and practice of Pope Francis, um, but that, that could be for another time and another occasion. Uh, but uh, basically, I mean, I, I saw a poem, uh, a Geoffrey Chaucer, one of our great English poems, uh, who am I per per permitted to quote him, although it might shock some? Go ahead. We are shocking here. This uh, is the Awareness he, Foundation. Thank you. Well, I, I will shock you then. He said, uh, I, I uh, take it out of context, uh, 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 in the, uh, the, the Parsons tale, that Parsons, that is clergy people, should all be shitty shepherds. <laughs> that is... And, and Pope Francis has taken this analogy. I don't think he probably read Chaucer, um, uh, but uh, Pope Francis took this analogy and said the pastors should have the smell of the sheep on them. Uh, yes. and that is very much a, a concept uh, that Pope Francis has developed in his terms of pastoral theology. That's very true. That's very true. Um, if you even today, if you hug somebody. Um, you you take the smell of that somebody if they have perfume, that's that's very uh, basic in life, uh, basic physics. So if if we embrace Christ, we we, we must uh, radiate uh, his perfume. So um, uh, guys, um, any anyone would like to to uh, ask Tim, please go ahead. Um, unmute yourself and fire away. But please be kind. <laughs> and don't be kind. <laughs> and, and Go do, ahead, do, Nancy. Do, you tell me where you're from, uh, where you're speaking from. Go ahead, Nancy. Um, I'm speaking from Western North Carolina, USA. Oh, um, in the mountains, that. yeah, up in the mountains near the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, I don't have a question, but I, I have a, a good story. When we Go were, ahead. we were talking about bread, we were talking about the pandemic, uh, the loss of hospitality. I was reminded of a woman who I follow on Facebook. Her name is Brenda Gant. She lives in a small town in South Alabama called Andalusia. She's a retired science teacher. When the pandemic broke out and everyone had to stay home and had to start cooking at home, she realized how many young women in particular did not know how to cook. They were used to restaurant meals, uh, microwave suppers, etc. So she decided that she would start cooking on Facebook. And she started with the most simple thing, which is homemade biscuits. And she demonstrated how they make biscuits in Alabama. Her mother did it. Her grandmother did it. She uses a huge dough bowl, which has been passed down. And she demonstrated how to make these biscuits. Not cookies, Not cookies but good bread. She started out in her, and she still cooks in her 1960s kitchen. I just checked her page. 
She now has 2,876,000 followers. Oh. That's <laughs> so it was a simple gesture and teaching the basics, going back to the bread, which is so important, not expensive. All you need is some flour and some water, some milk. Anyway. Thank you, Nancy, for, for, for this sharing. It is very poignant and it, it tells us a lot. Uh, uh, sharing and, and going to basics doesn't mean uh, spending millions and doesn't mean necessarily uh, being lavish. It, it, can, it can be really basic. Um, Steve Tabor, please. Well, let me make Steve. sure I'm, I'm unmuted, I hope. Um, uh, so it's a, a little bread story. Uh, um, about 50 years ago, a friend of mine in college gave me uh, some sourdough. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a California thing. Uh, uh, sourdough French bread is a... Is a uh, it's a big thing here. And uh, it had been in his family for that time, probably a hundred years, uh, passed down from generation to generation. And uh, I've kept this stuff alive uh, for the last 50 years. And uh, we make bread and pancakes and so on. And, and uh, one of the pastors in our church got interested in it. And uh, and he became a great devotee of, uh, of sourdough. But uh, but for me, it uh, it uh, um, it seems to symbolize the continuity of life and the and the fact that this uh, this substance that we are using to make our bread uh, has uh, descended down through the generations from uh, the people who originally settled the state, and uh, uh, I think it gives me a, a good sense of community with the people who preceded us and those who uh, uh, and those who uh, uh, who will succeed us and uh, and uh, as well as being a cultural thing for Californians. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Um, Huda, you raised your hand. I think uh, two two ways. Uh, I, I would see in our different ways in our different traditions. We would do so in the the, the sacrament meal, which we know by different names in uh, according to the churches we belong to, uh, but also in the Word of God uh, in Scripture, um, uh, it it is sweeter than honey, um, and there are aspects of physically taking into ourselves uh, the the Scriptures. Uh, that, that nourishes us. Uh, so there is that element of, of, of uh, sustenance, not just in hearing the word, but also consuming the word. Um, that, uh, and, and that in itself conveys the word of life, the bread of life, which is Jesus, because the whole of the Bible speaks of the centrality of God's work in Christ, uh, who is the fulfillment of the old, as well as pointing to the new. Thank you, Huda. Um, anybody wants to fire at Tim? <laughs> since we are living in a war situation. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Bruce? Bruce, Bruce? Bruce here from uh, West London. Uh, and, well, thank you very much. This is my first time participating in one of these events. And Tim, just the richness with which you've expounded and explained the multi levels of bread, you know, throughout scripture is lovely, really, really, really helpful. Uh, and particularly, you know, around so many societies, that bread is the absolute fundamental part of a meal. I had a lot to do with Afghanistan, living there, working there for 20 years with, with different organization. And, with Afghans, it didn't matter what you had to eat, you could give the most lavish meal. 
But if you hadn't bred, you hadn't eaten. <laughs> yes. You know, and I guess Middle Eastern is perhaps something similar to that. But in, in just in Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, you know, it's not I was the bread of life, it's I am the bread of life. You know, and what I, however we define our, our main meal, it's like every day we need to feed in Christ. We need his sustenance. You know, and it's just so helpful to be reminded of that, you know, with the use of bread in so many realms, or, you know, around scripture, which you've done. So thank you for sharing that. It's been very, very refreshing. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Bruce. Yes, uh, um, the, it is a, a multi, multi-dimensional uh, mm. image of, of, of Jesus uh, sharing with us and with his disciples and generation after generation, uh, reminding us also always to go to the basics. And, the, and he is the basics of, of our, our existence. Uh, there is nothing more basic than, than the creator, than the, the Jesus Christ in whom everything was created. Um, Tim, um, today we are many, many, um, parts of the world are facing wars from Ukraine to Syria to Iraq to Yemen to Somalia to Libya to you you name it I I, I, I don't know I mean after 2,000 years of um, civilization after Christ we end up in this brutal world with more than 80 million refugees. What happened to the basic, uh, what happened to the basic sustenance of, of, of the church preaching peace in Christ, the bread of heaven? A long and difficult one and without particularizing or pointing fingers, one has to say that sometimes the church failed Christ uh, by abandoning that way of uh, primitive simplicity of life. Uh, one has only to think of the Franciscan movement, uh, of, of the papacy uh, adopting this radical approach to life that Francis of Assisi led, uh, and, and, and preaching freely and, and sharing all things in common. Uh, yes, the papacy I accepted to start with, but it was only 100, 200 years later that uh, um, voluntary poverty uh, was condemned by the Catholic Church. And so there is a sense in which the Church itself has failed uh, to live up to the expectations of living out uh, the, the Christ, who is the bread of life, bread uh, for the world, uh, the bread of heaven, the one who points to God. Uh, because it has become too um, ensnared by the temptations of the bread that is offered to the world at a price uh, and uh, not uh, to be shared. Uh, and so, you know, the temptation that Jesus had, uh, we, have, we have all taken those temptations uh, and failed um, it miserably. You're, you're mute, Nadim. Thank you, Tim. April says, bread church in Liverpool, yeah. where they make bread, one for yourself and one to share. And yeah. while it is baking, they have fellowship. And this is a Methodist initiative. Yes, uh, Barbara Glass and, uh, and, and others have developed this. We have uh, uh, bread making at, in our church at Wesley in Chester every week on a Monday. And a group come together um, and, and some are those who, who need bread. And some of those are, who, uh, are, are those people who have skills to enable them to make bread. Uh, and this um, merging of, of people coming together to share what they have uh, is still very much part of the life of some of our churches. 
Uh, so yes, thank you for commending that. I thought about it a little while ago and thought <laughs> I better not mention it. It's another Methodist thing. Yes, but yes, other churches are taking this up. Uh, and of course, in our primitive Methodist tradition, the love feast was very important, where a sharing of a simple bread bun or, or currant bun uh, was part of that fellowship in which they, they broke it uh, and they shared testimony and shared all things in common. Um, um, my last question to you, uh, the bread broke, the body of Christ broke on the cross. And um, in the resurrection, the bread became whole again. And um, so that we, we, we become whole again in Christ. Uh, to, to, to end on a, on a, on a positive note, um, I want to, to ask you, how do we... Um, restore the bread in our lives today? How do we restore the broken humanity, the broken body of Christ? I think it's accepting our brokenness uh, and then uh, taking the resources that are needed to put those pieces together. Um, I, 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 because we each have something to offer the other um, in, in terms of physically what we can share, but also spiritually. Uh, and so bringing people together. Uh, Richard's just put in, in the chat function uh, about William Booth. Uh, I'm afraid another uh, ex-Methodist who founded the uh, Salvation Army. Um, but certainly that sense in which communities can be rebuilt um, and, and which are basically social enterprises uh, in today's economic terms. Um, we ought to be doing more of that, more macro bus uh, micro businesses, uh, more employment agencies of giving people not only the basic necessities that they need, but also the skills that they need. Um, should we be a society in British terms that depends, many people depend on the existence of food banks, it brings us back to the question uh, about, uh, is it just charity giving locally, or, or is it about speaking to government uh, and, and affecting public policy? I've always said it's not a, an either or, it's a both and. Mm. Uh, let me remind, uh, let me uh, read what Richard said for the people on Facebook. This reminds me of William Booth, who found uh, a local mill was under uh, paying its staff. He set up an enterprise which under, undersold the errand shop and put them out of business. Perhaps we should become Christian entrepreneurs. Yes, why not? Yeah. Um, there are plenty of shops empty that we could take over. Especially uh, after the pandemic. Absolutely, yes. It would restore the life of our city centres if we had uh, a network of Christian-based uh, 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 shops, um, which would encourage employment and industry and skill building. Yes, I'm sure this is something we should be doing. Uh, and that itself would be giving bread to the people uh, and, and sh uh, sharing a witness of the Christ who is the bread of life, uh, which is, has a spiritual dimension to it as well as a physical dimension to it. I have one minute to say thank you very much for everybody who, sh who, who came on board uh, today. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Tim McCubbin. Can, can I share a, a prayer just to finish? Absolutely, you can. It's, yes. it's a prayer for the first Sunday in Lent coming up. And uh, uh, if we can pray together, I pray, Gracious Father, your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world evermore give us this bread that he may live in us and we in him to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you very much Tim for thought-provoking and engaging uh, talk. Uh, I want to thank everybody and welcome you all to the Awareness Foundation.
Tim, thank you very much. Thank you My for pleasure. all, and God bless you, and thank you for joining.